Warning, the following is my opinion. And even though it's 100% correct, it's just my opinion. So this is a trigger warning. Trigger warning for, for, for all the modeling bros who are about to get uh, their undies in a bunch. You know what I'm saying? Well, hello there. My name is HW. Thank you so much for watching Tone Junkie TV. This thing is not even on. My friends, I was right. Modeling is dead. <laughs> modeling is dead. How did we get here? I'm even impressed. Now, I'm not just here to brag and point out that two years ago I made this video called Modeling is Dead, and eight months ago I then made this follow-up video. Uh, it's over. Modeling is peaked. No, no. Uh, I, I want to I recap those real quick to show how we got here, but actually I really want to focus on the future and where this brings us. Where does this bring the modeling community and what does this mean for us? Because we actually got here a lot faster than I thought we were going to get here. Um, these videos have been two of the best performing on my channel. Um, they've actually connected me with a lot of people in the modeling industry. I had several people reach out to me and this met, led to a, like some pretty great relationships. Um, so. Um, First video, modeling is dead. I basically point out that we have this situation forming in the modeling world where after looking at the Kemper market, it became obvious to me that when you open up creation to the community, when you sort of democratize tone, um, the community can end up making more tones that serve all of the small niches of the market much better than uh, a centralized group of developers who are modeling, maybe component by component or or sort of amp by amp or whatever, right? And then the question becomes, well, does the community even want more, right? Just because the just because outsourcing it to the community and uh, results in more supply, is there demand to fill it? And what we see uh, with demand, and I'll tell you, as I would probably be an expert in how much demand there is for Kemper Profiles, uh, Helix stuff, because I'm watching my sales, um, I'll tell you that there there is seemingly no end in sight to the amount of boutique AC30 clones that people want to have profiled captured. There's no end in sight to the amount of vintage marshals with this mic or that mic or this speaker or that speaker. There is no end in sight to a, a tone crafted specifically for blues, crafted specifically for jazz, crafted specifically with these effects in mind or this type of thing, maybe ambient or worship in mind. There is no end in sight. I just had one of the most successful product releases I've ever had in Tone Junkie history. Do you know what it was? An EVH inspired pack. There's no end in sight to the amount of artist packs people want. And, and all of those things that I just described have been ideas that have been given to me by the community for which I have then gone and created products around, right? So I just listen to the community. I watch, where is the community saying there's demand? And I try to come in with supply, right? Um, uh, and th 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 this, is, this is how I sort of combine my love of investing in economics with tone and guitar and entrepreneurship and YouTube and all of these things, right? And so then uh, now here we are, right? Um, uh, and, and I think you see that that is really true with Cortex Cloud. Look how many captures are on Cortex Cloud. Look at um, ToneNet. And one of the greatest features is every week ToneNet puts out a top 10 most downloaded, most, and I uh, 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 most liked. And I find myself competing competing, right? And every week it's me and Amalgam Audio just kind of fighting out for who's the top that week, who gave away the best free thing, right? And I love that. The competition makes me better because I see he puts out stuff and I go, I got to do something like that. And it makes everybody better, right? It's uh, it's like the old principle, as iron sharpens iron. Um, and there's this, this, this rubbing, this the way you sharpen knives, the way you sharpen a sword. You know, you see someone does something, oh, that gives me an idea, I can do it better. And there's a there's a grind, there's a rub in the competition, but at the end, everybody's better. It's beautiful. And it's better for the community too. Uh, eight months ago, I made a video called Modeling Has Peaked, and I pointed out where we have a perverse incentive in the modeling world where basically most of the work to produce these units is done up front, most of the labor, and then the units are put out. That creates a large community who are then relying on a group of developers to do constant updates. And what I noticed was that in most communities, the desire for updates lagged behind the developers producing the updates. Now, sometimes you find communities like Helix, where I think largely the Helix community is happy with the job that Line 6 is doing, making updates, and they appreciate it. Kemper has had huge updates, um, but they haven't been uh, equal over time. I think there have been some periods of less updates and then some periods of huge, huge, huge updates. And now we're in a little lull of updates. I'd love to see Kemper update some of the choruses 
Um, I think there's there's room to improve the vibratos and choruses. There's been a lot more vibrato and chorus sounds making its way into popular music. I'd love to see some expansion there. But we've seen in crazy new capabilities come to the Kemper in the way of effects, speaker modeling. They added a whole cabinet that you could, then your Kemper can run it. It's calibrated for it with a touch of a button. It has speaker mod. Anyway, there's updates. And you see this sort of communities flow in and out of, we want more updates. Yay, we just got an update. We want, we want more updates. Where's the updates? Where's the updates? How come no one's updating? How come no, this company is a scam. Oh, yay, we got more updates. And it's 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 going to function like that, not in the most efficient way, because the companies are not always the don't always have clear financial incentives to support the community with updates, because updates may not result in actually creating new um, sales. Whereas something like developing a sister unit may, and you can achieve both things. You can develop a sister unit and do some updates and sort of combine that, the cost of that development. But you, you run into this thing where we don't have the most clear incentives, right? And that always leads to inefficiency. That always leads to inefficiency. Um, and, and it can create to, it can, and there's even, I'll make another video on this, but there's even some very perverse incentives where I see several manufacturers actually do things that I think are quite detrimental to the community long term. But I believe they're doing it for their own short-term economics. I think it's a little bit short-sighted. We'll get into that in the future. I'm not going to touch that on this video. But who is not in a capture tech now? Who's not there? I mean, where we've gotten now. Listen, Kemper, the, the originator, the, the very first. These guys had to invent a new word. Nobody even had a word for what they did. They invented, they were like, this is a profile. It is a... It is a version of the amp. It's a grab of the amp right there at that setting, at those settings. And they worked in all this functionality to change it, edit it, and really the Kemper, what made it unique, what makes it so special even today, is that it captures, a lot of people miss this, it captures the character of the breakup and then allows you to add more of that breakup or less of that breakup. And it does that purposefully because it actually means you can grab the sweet spot of that deluxe reverb breaking up before the bass flubs out. You can grab it at seven or eight, and then you can increase that gain, getting you the maximum gain of a deluxe reverb, but maintaining tightness, maintaining that, that mid-range before the amp flubs out and loses definition and does all these things. It's actually still something nobody else has done. I gotta do some more, I'm gonna do a video on why the, Kemp, the, the features the Kemper still has that nobody else has replicated yet. But then you move in, who was next? Well, you started seeing, uh, you started seeing other people, you started seeing more kind of do a similar thing. You start doing, but boom, we get the quad cortex. Boom, we get, um, uh, obviously there was the, the tone matching and axe effects, right? Um, and actually, I'm not going to link this, but, but you can go look online. Uh, axe effects has a, uh, a patent for basically tone capturing. Uh, so I'm going to consider them sort of in this group of people who've gone to capturing. IK Multimedia obviously came out with Tonex after developing the software first, then the pedal. And now we have Head Rush, sort of Head Rush, sort of uh, somebody who I would say wasn't at the forefront of the pack, sort of leapfrogging in terms of available feature sets into the front. And so now here we're left going, who are the big players left with no modeling capability, or no, no capture capability? Who's really left just in the modeling space? It's pretty much just line six. And if you want to look at another player, let's say Boss, right? Um, I think I think Boss is a year or two away. I think we're easily going to see Boss do this. And, you know, to me, it's like the Head Rush has it now. Uh, Tonex has it now. Um, Quad Cortex obviously has it. Um, Kemper has it. Um, I mean, we're just all over the place. Uh, if the next version of Helix doesn't com contain some sort of capture tech, it's really going to have people scratching their head. Because, because I think everyone can recognize this. When I look at my Helix, I've said this before, when I look at my Helix, I try to always judge the Helix based on tone mo uh, 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 models of amps, not based on the Helix overall. And Because I think some of them are really stellar, and some of them I think are a little bit lackluster. Some of the very older ones, the much older ones, um, are the ones that I think are not quite as lovely, let's say. And sometimes they lack a little bit of features. Like, how come my deluxe, I'm sorry, how come my, my twin reverb doesn't have a bright switch? 
Well, the AMP does. Why doesn't that model? Yet, as time has gone on, Helix has been a lot more accurate about if an AMP has a control, we're going to put that in. And so, you can see the evolution of maybe their thought process from, we're not trying to be exactly like every single model to, we're going to be a lot more accurate. You notice the train wreck uh, model in there has a three position bright switch, right? Um, you notice uh, other, you can look at other models and, and see how accurate they are to, to, the, to the button layout and stuff. And then you can look at some of the original launch models and see there was some, okay, let's add a presence. This amp doesn't have a presence. That's okay. You can add it. Um, and that's, that's, Neither way is right or wrong. I think you can just see maybe a little bit in the change of philosophy or maybe maybe them changing their approach based on customer feedback. Um, and I think that's always very wise. But where are we going to go from here? Where are we going to go from here? Does it make financial sense? And this is a question I asked back then. If you develop a capture tech that is very accurate, does it make financial sense to take, you know, 50, 60% of your development time and put it towards creating AMP models when you could cut that down. Now, I know a lot of the development time goes towards making the unit work, but I'm saying let's take the amount of time that you have set aside to make models or make presets, make the sounds that are going to go in there, actually model the tones. If you could cut that down and just make a bunch of captures, is anyone going to be upset about that? If you could cut now, you're going to say, well, well, HW, what about uh, the, the portion of the community that wants accurate tone models? They want an AC30 that doesn't have a separate EQ attached on top of it. They want an AC30 that has the cut knob that's really placed in the back end. They're not looking, that's not replaced by a presence knob that's, you know, just, just like a studio EQ. And that's what most of these EQ units are. It's just like a studio EQ placed on top of the tone model. Like, like, and I've said this in a lot of content. The, the EQ we have in the Kemper, the Quad Cortex, the Head Rush, uh, IK Multimedia Tone X, think of it like a channel strip EQ that the mixing engineer has to control your sound. And I've said this in a lot of content, a lot of people think, no, I want the AC30. Trust me, the Edge walks in, he's been using the same AC30 set, uh, set up for all this time. The engineer is not going, can you please cut, uh, braise the cut a little bit? That thing's dialed in, it sounds great, all the sounds get recorded, it later goes somewhere else, and it's in mixing that you're gonna have adjustments to get around the vocal, or you're gonna have a pad come in. So what do you want that chugga chugga guitar sound over the pad, or the chicka 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 chicka? You're gonna have, that's gonna boost the presence. You're gonna take out low end because you got this other pad going. You, it's different frequencies need to come out because it's like a choir singing all the time. Sometimes the bass is the most, is the, is the melody. That's the most, that's the ear candy. It's the thing you want to hear the most. Sometimes it's over here. So I've never really quite understood the, I need to have an AC30 that sounds like an AC30, especially because most people don't know what an AC30, bro. I've owned pre-top boost AC30s. I actually haven't owned them. I just have a lot of experience with them because many friends own pre-top boost AC30s. I've had my hands on them. They've lived in this home for a while. But I have owned several uh, post uh, uh, or uh, um, post top boost or top boosted AC15, AC10, AC30, AC50s, AC100s. I have an AC4 that I still own. It's at Carter's. Go buy it um, if you'd like it. Um, I, all that stuff is there, and most people have no idea. You have most people have no idea what an AC10 even sounds like. They've never had their hands on one. They've played a reissue. No, most people go, oh, the, an AC30. I had a Korg 90s one, bro. That is so miles away. I mean, my, and it really is miles away from uh, from a pre-top boost to a top boost, which are very different from each other. The Brian May sound and the Edge sound are two different amps. They're two different amplifiers. You could have called them something different. Instead, they they greatly changed the filtering and the controls in the AC30 to make basically a new AC30. They, if they didn't call them both the AC30, we would think of them as very different amps. In the same way we think of a JTM45 and a Plexi as different amps, I would venture to say the pre-top boost AC30 and the top boost AC30 are that different. It's To me, when I listen and I, go, especially when you talk about changing the EF86 preamp tube, in addition to the bass treble, in addition to the cut control, 
in a day, I mean, it's to me, it's like, yeah, that is that is almost akin to a, J, uh, a JTM 45 becoming a JMP 50 watt. It's a different amp. One's a Plex, I mean, they're both Plexis, but but one's the, what we think of as the Plexi sound, the super lead, the 50 watt version even. You know, that sound, that rock and roll sound to the JTM 45, and in the middle you have the Hendrix Super Amplifier 100, 45100, the, the sort of migration to that circuit, right? From one circuit to the other. Anyway, anyway, that's, that's amplifier history and stuff. But the point here is, um, People want different things. Sometimes you want the model that's like maybe very accurate with that tone stack. Sometimes you want the other thing, but I think what's true, what everybody wants, they want the next best thing, right? That's why there's no end to what Tone Junkie will make. There's no end. I'll ne Guys, trust me, I'm not running into people, running out of people who want stuff. If anything, what we have happening in the market right now and why my business has had to change as someone who primarily was just a Kemper guy, and I'm still a Kemper guy. Like if you, I literally bleed green. I cut myself with a carrot the other day. It was very confusing, you know? And it was like, is this, is this an all natural vegetable juice? What is it? It's literally green, green blood. That was a bad joke. Um, I, I play the Kemper out live three times a month um, out of my house, you know? And I, in your monitors, playing the tunes, you know? And, and it's perfect for that. Um, I play all these other units in my house. I have experimented with other units outside my house. They work great. It's just, I have my go-to sounds and I grab it and go. I don't bust it out here and try to change them every week. You know what I mean? I've got my stuff. I do start to make adjustments though sometimes because uh, it's fun, right? But in here, a lot of times I'm trying to do other stuff. Maybe we're working on the Eddie Van Halen stuff. Maybe we're working, working on some worship stuff. Maybe we're working on uh, whatever, how to get the most accurate touch sensitive plexi tone. There's no end. The only thing that's changing in this market, and what, and I, I, I'm just telling you from a Tone Junkie perspective, what's changing for Tone Junkie is I'm watching all the people who discovered Tone Junkie and rallied around Tone Junkie for these years in the Kemperverse, they're now branching out. Some of them are now going, oh, now I play a quad cortex. Some of them are going, actually, now I play a quad cortex or, or I play Kemper still, but I also, with my pedal board, am using a Tone X. I like my pedal board, I, it's a small form factor. Oh, now I, I've always used the HX Stomp and my Kemper, what do you have for me there? It, this is the great segmentation of the market. This is something in my past career I actually found when uh, I was selling into one of the most largely segmented markets. I'll tell you what that business was. I was in a business where I was selling work apparel and this was the dynamic of work apparel. Do you know who sells the most work apparel in this country? Probably the most uh, uh, work apparel is sold or rather rented through these large laundry services, Cintas, Aramark. You might know Aramark, they do a lot of facility services. If you ever go to a convention hall or convention center, the food might be made by Cintas or Aramark. But those are those companies actually started, now they're larger conglomerates, but they started actually as laundry companies. They would wash your work clothes and deliver it back to your work. So if you're a blue collar guy, you're the milk salesman, the milk delivery guy or whoever, you would go show up, they'd give you five changes of your uniform. You had one for every day and then you turned it back in. They'd hand you five more. You, you gave them the five dirty ones, they gave you five clean ones. So your company actually had purchased 10 uniforms for you. Half are being washed, half are not being washed. Now here's what happened in the market I that I found myself in. My family, my father actually, who was a mechanic turned teacher. He started then he taught mechanics. He actually started a business selling work apparel into the automotive industry. And you know why it worked so well? It worked so well because the automotive industry became so segmented. Meaning, yes, there's Jiffy Lube and there's all these big ones and they do the contracts, but how many Jim's Auto, Bob's Auto, you know, Ted's tires, uh, Andrea's transmissions, how many of those exist in your town or where you live? Tons. The, being a mechanic and working for yourself became the norm. Over 50% of that market became small moms and pops who had one and two employees. Guess what? The economics of the laundry industry were such that they couldn't service anyone who I think had under five or six employees. That meant their very business model. They were the largest players in the game. Their very business model meant they could not make money on half the market because half the market was too small to service. The dollars were too small. So where were these people gonna go? The internet. 
right? And this was early on. My dad starts coming in the early aughts when the internet was not fully flushed out. You know, Amazon hadn't eaten everybody's lunch and eventually they did come in and eat everybody's lunch. My dad's a smart guy. He sold at the right time. He really did because Amazon has just been eating all those markets up and, um, and, and manufacturers are helping them do it, to be honest with you. Um, the entire distributor model in the United States for most goods is will, will be dead in this decade. Um, anyway, my dad's a smart guy. Um, but that was an industry where the market was so segmented, you had to figure out how to serve this market in a different way because its makeup was different. This ultra high segmentation, Jim's auto, Bob's auto, this auto, this auto, this auto. You had some companies up here who had already gobbled up the market. I have the biggest uh, user. I have the biggest company who does this, the biggest company who does this, and that's their whole business up here. Half the market was down here. Do you see what I'm saying? Half the market went unserved. And so now I'm in this process as, as Tone Junkie trying to figure out how do I serve now this much more highly segmented market? This is a challenge I'm thinking through a lot of this. And to be honest with you, I'm already failing. I'm already about to hit weekend number two where I'm meant to have a Kemper pack ready for my Kemper audience, but it's not ready. Two amps broke on me, and this week I literally was not able to finish the Mesa Mark Five, uh, Mark Seven, which is an amp that has tons and tons of Kemper stuff. Now that'll be out early next week, so I'm 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 basically three or four days behind schedule. But a lot of those guys are used to Friday and Saturday releases, so you see how I'm having to change. I have to change what I'm doing and figure out how to serve the same people. But now that it's highly segmented, I need to touch different areas. It brings up these questions of, can we go deep or do we go wide? Can you do both? I don't know. But I know that these manufacturers are in, in a similar uh, rub, you know? How do you create feature sets that continue to monetize in the future um, while also packing value into a unit right up front. And I think the market has been clear, it's moved, it's moving to capture tech must be included or people will see you as a little bit second tier. Now I'm not putting down the Helix when I say that. The Helix is about 11 years old. I'm not faulting it for not having a feature that may be important now that wasn't important 11 years ago. And a lot of people are gonna go like, the Helix is the best sounding ever. I'm perfectly happy on the Helix. I don't care what other people do. That's totally fine. I mean, yeah, I, I, listen. I just told you I love the Kemper and it's older than the Helix, right? But what I see is that back then the Kemper had the features and the vision that to democratize tone, to democratize and sort of outsource the creation of content for the community. And you might say, well, not everyone wants to create content. Well, that's, that's quite honestly bull. You know what I'm saying? Because content isn't just me talking in this camera. Content's not just a kid doing pranks on people on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. Content's also the new thing you're gonna go download and play this weekend. That's content, right? It's not video content. It's not audio content. It's not, it's not uh, you know, written content. It's something though. It's content that you are gonna download. It's something to do. That's the thing. All of these units are going to run into this. These units strive, th these units excel when there's communities around them. Look at two of the biggest communities right now on Facebook and on the groups, on the forums and everything. The two biggest ones that have the most members on Facebook, that are the most talked about, that have the most stuff going on, it's Kemper and Helix. And that's why they're still alive. A decade later, I'm still seeing new units. You guys, new to, I'm still seeing. Tone Junkie Loaded Kemper sell at British Audio. But if you go on some of these boards, you'd think nobody's buying a Kemper today. That's not true. <laughs> it's not true because I'm even seeing people go back to the Kemper because they realize how much content is there for it. And how and and you know, look, if you want a touch screen, it's not there. If you if you it, it, you know, Helix still has the best editor of anybody on on uh, 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 anywhere, right? They still have the best on-screen editor. And that's one of the reasons the Helix is still so active after all these years. And they have all these different form factors. That's not slowing down. But where do we go from here? What happens when all of this becomes just like a high school diploma? It's ubiquitous. It's 
you have to have this stuff or it's or no one takes you seriously. Now enter this. The free, this, this is NAM. NAM is something I'm gonna be doing videos on in the next two weeks or so. Because NAM is an open source, 100% free capture technology that is a plugin. It's a free plugin and it's open source. And, and what's really interesting is how fast NAM is growing. Because I've seen some manufacturers tell me, oh, the reason we put in this feature and not this feature is for the elegance. I, I don't think uh, people want to do all this file sharing and stuff. And, uh, and, and I think it's just easier to sort of hit download and things appear, right? I think there's a lot of truth in that when it comes from UI design. But what we're seeing with NAM is, wait a minute, open source, it's hard as heck to use. You gotta go to GitHub, you gotta download this. Now cue all the NAM fanboys saying, no, it's not hard to use, it's super simple. Listen, you're not normal people. Listen, this is my message to all the NAM people. You're not normal. You're Android people, right? I don't say that with any shade. You're Android people. You are the type of people who like to experiment. You're the type of people who probably when you were a kid took your radio apart to see how it works. That makes you very intelligent. It doesn't make you normal, actually, though. Most people didn't take their radio apart. It doesn't, now, it, it probably means you have a bend towards engineering and mathematics and logical thinking and understanding. Um, and that's, that's a type of person in society. But let me tell you something. I get all these guys in their 50s, their 60s. You guys, they're asking me how to, they still ask me, how do I plug my Kemper into my computer? They've never done it. They're a big part of the market. Who do you think's buying Boss Katanas? Who do you think's, I mean, these guys who tell me this Helix stuff is too complicated to plug in. I, I, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is a big part of the market. These people exist. And there are a lot of, they are a lot of the reason why I've made some content, how to import into the Kemper, how to import, I'm about to make one, how to import into Tonex, how to import into the Helix. I've had to make these videos because people ask me these questions so much. So. Right now there's a group of people who are the early adopters of an open source platform where, and I hear a lot of them saying the complaints, there's no centralized place to go get things. How do I know whether one thing's good or the other? How do I, there's just, you gotta try and stuff. That's the beauty of open source and it's the ugliness of open source. It's how the sausage gets made. It ain't pretty. You ever watch my grandmother, my aunt Dolly makes sausage. Um, my grandmother uh, uh, has passed now, God rest her soul, but um, you know, you watch them do it, man. They're literally in old school sausage machine. They are stuffing this meat, then this, this, this fat and meat and all this stuff, the stuff you couldn't sell as a steak, and they're just stuffing it in. Into what? Pig fat, pig intestine, liner. Man, the sausage is ugly, but boy, it's delicious. It is delicious. You get involved in NAM and you quickly see, oh my gosh. How do you make one of these things? You gotta go get, you gotta use cloud computation on Google Collab, you gotta do this and that. There's five people who have made repositories where you can go put stuff and they everything is still in these early stages and you've been, is it gonna work? No, you already have the community fighting with itself. I don't think it should be done that way. I think this should be done that way. You've already got, and then you've got overlap. Three people have made very similar solutions to each other. Who's gonna win? No one's gonna win, it's open source. The community wins. You use this or you use that, you know? And then and then you see someone like me and I, I look at that market and I go, well, exactly. This is the, the pain points of that. How do I know what's good or what's not? It's why people watch these videos because eventually people learn that Tone Junkie guy, I really dig his clean marshals and his overdriven marshals. I really dig the way he go, his style. I dig what he's doing with those fenders. I dig this. Maybe for another high gain or something, I prefer someone else, right? I like Sin Mix because I like new metal. I'm, I don't know much about new metal tone and I can't do everything, right? So different strokes for different folks, but I'm watching Nam going, here's open source and free. And at the end of the day, what I think is gonna happen ultimately, this is my real prediction. If you're watching this far in the video, thank you. I'm gonna give you my real prediction for the future. I think eventually all of these platforms are gonna morph into computers. Yes, laptops, whatever, iPads, whatever. But we're gonna get some sort of a system 
that just runs VST plugins on itself. And maybe that will just be on your iPad and then you're controlling it through something else. Maybe it's just a separate little phone or maybe it's just, hey, here's a little computer. And all you do is you just sit this in the in, behind your stuff or you sit it on your pedal board or whatever. And all it does is interface with other equipment that gives you different UI capability, you know? And you can, and there's a version, there's a touch, oh, there's a touch screen pedal so I can interact with my, my processor in that way. What does the processor do? Well, the processor, um, or, or what does a processing unit do? Well, it's just a little computer that runs VSTs. It's basically, I'm basically playing through a DAW that runs VSTs. Because I think, honestly, a lot of people, you can bring your laptop on stage, but let's look at the form factor of a laptop. There's a reason people don't want it on stage. It's not designed to be on a stage. It's designed to be on a desk. It's not designed actually to be very shockproof from falling over or waterproof on top. Because when you're on a desk, you don't spill your coffee on things. There's another version. Now, the military gets around this by making those sort of otter box laptops. That's a solution, something like that. But another solution would be to look and go, oh, guitar players probably just want something all in one and they may want to combine other units and they also need floor capability. So maybe this is a unit that mounts underneath your floorboard that uses solid state drives. So it's shock resistant. It runs VSTs. You can plug it into some sort of a Helix controller unit with a touchscreen capability and there's and everything's already written there's already compatibility built in and this thing runs vsts and it's all i'm so what are you running oh well i'm running auto tune on because i got a vocal mic going through which is what the headrush just did but maybe it's more modular now in the future and you know i've got my whole controller but i'm also combining it with this other unit it's my vintage effects unit because i like that so i brought it with me i put it on my board too so i'm running that in a loop and I'm also, um, I'm also running my, uh, it's also running a separate, uh, you, you know, maybe it's running the Tone Junkie IR loader. Maybe it's running the Tone Junkie IR loader and it's running NAM, but it's also all my effects are coming from Helix Native that I'm running in here. And I, maybe I've got Helix Native running in front and I've got a second instance of Helix Native running in the back. Uh, or I've routed it so it's Helix native, but it's using another VST of NAM or the Tonex VST uh, in there. And oh, I have to have the Big Sky plugin. I just love that one so much. So I have that running as well. And now we're just towards, we're just going, who's a manufacturer of hardware? And that is actually the Android model where Android is the operating system that brings and tells developers, develop on this platform and I can be the bridge, I'm the operating system that can be basically made to run on uh, any processor, right? And there's versions of, of Android OS that run on different processors, but everything's built to be compatible with the Android store, which opens up developers. And that is the tie between. So developers can make software, hardware makers can make hardware, and the operating system people in the middle make the operating system. That, my friends, is how computers have happened. That's how we've built all of this. Now, you do have a company like Apple where the hardware is the software and what you're gonna get there, what you're gonna get there, hear me on this, is the quad cortex. What you're gonna get there is always the smoothest user experience because there's 100% accountability from hardware, from, from literally chip design to end user. 100% accountability. Meaning the chip will do, will have the functionality to make sure it does all the processes designed to give the end user XYZ experience. The other thing I described is when chip users are going, we think people will want this. Here's our product array. Here's our feature sets. That will then be used by the OSs who will say, we're supporting this, this, and this, because that gets us this capability. Developers then say, now I can use that capability. Developers will inevitably run into something. I'd like to do this. Eh, we run into a snag over here. That capability wasn't put in the operating system. Do you see what I'm saying? It's over. It's over. Most companies are going to, most smaller companies are going to find it not advantageous economically to be Apple computers, to do front to end. They may. They may still do it but they're gonna to have to put in AMP cloning features. They're gonna to have to put in AMP capture features. They're gonna to have to put in whatever. Because look, and, and it's not just AMP cloning. Why shouldn't I be able to, why shouldn't I be able to just 
go, you know what? I've always run API 512s and I just want to capture those. I want to clone those. I want to put those in my signal chain. What's wrong with that? Nothing. You know what? I use my 1176 at this um, at this uh, setting. I've always used it. I love what it does to my tone. Adds a little compression. Why can't I capture that? Guess what? You can. That's my opinion. Thanks for watching Tone Jagged TV. HW, out.